All right, well, hopefully this setup is at least a little bit nicer to look at than the horrible setup that I had in the last video. But as I've mentioned before, I am literally recording on an active construction site in an empty room with tile floors and nothing in it. Yeah, so even though I'm using a nice microphone I just bought, I probably wouldn't expect the best audio quality from this video, but hopefully soon. Hey, at least this is a good test of how well the RA20 can reject a completely, completely reflective, reflective room. room. So this is a question that's based off of one that came from the Q&A that I did in the last video. I think it warranted its own completely separate video, so that's what we're going to do today. How to buy the perfect microphone for you when you can't actually test the microphone for yourself. We don't all get the chance to hear a microphone on our specific voice before we decide to pull the trigger on three or $400 worth of equipment. And the fact is that most YouTubers are going to say, rightfully so, that they cannot recommend a piece of gear to you without hearing your specific voice. But that is really frustrating because we have no way to figure out what microphone we wanna spend money on if no one is going to recommend anything to us. Therefore, we're gonna to need to figure out which microphone we want to buy based off of quantifiable specifications, data, rather than the feel of the microphone. We're going off of things that we can measure rather than things that are you know, more emotional, things that like resonate with us on a personal level because we can't hear the microphone. So I've kind of put together a process for how to choose a microphone for you, and I hope it works for you. It's worked for me in the past. First off, if you just wanna opt out of this entire situation and you just want a microphone that's gonna get you where you need to go, I have two mics that I think they're the cheat code. They're the shortcut, the Shure SM57, the Shure SM58, they're the same microphone. One just has the fancy grill that you see on every drawing that a four-year-old does of a microphone. Now, I know there are people that actually prefer other microphones that are a similar in price and similar in tone and build and design, but the fact is that the Shure SM57 and the Shure SM58 have the most proven track record of any microphone on the planet. And the reason that's important is because if you're looking for a specific application of the Shure SM57 or the Shure SM58, I promise you someone has done it in the past and I promise you it's documented somewhere on the internet. There is such a backlog of support for these two microphones that if you don't want to think about the microphone you're going to buy, you're not really interested in the gear, you just need to know, buy one of those two. With that out of the way, let us begin the process. All right, the first and most important decision I would say is dynamic or condenser. Both of these microphones are built completely differently as I've explained in the past in some other videos. The dynamic microphone is a magnet with a copper wire wrapped around it. The movement of that magnet makes an electrical pulse that can be transferred and amplified through a series of other equipment that follows it down the chain. Dynamic microphones are passive, meaning you don't need anything to power them. They're going to produce an electrical signal that can then be powered later on down the line. Now the condenser microphone is going to use a diaphragm, which essentially makes a capacitance by having two small flexible plates move and that difference in pressure, I'm not a scientist, but it makes an electrical charge that can be sent further down the line. Now the difference is the condenser microphone is going to need to be powered with phantom power or 48 volt power. That's not a big deal. If you have an audio interface, which you're going to need for either version of these microphones, it's gonna have phantom power. Now dynamic microphones are known for a few specific things. One, being extremely durable, being able to take higher volume levels. They're almost universally used for live sound applications when compared to a condenser microphone, unless you're talking about a handheld super cardioid condenser, which is its own niche, don't worry about it. And most of all, dynamic microphones are known for better room rejection, which is the exact reason I'm using a dynamic microphone right now. Now they're not perfect, as you can probably tell by the audio of this video, but it's gonna be way less noticeable than on a uh, condenser. So yeah, if you're worried about the environment that you're going to be recording in, a dynamic microphone is going to basically reject the room a whole lot better. Now with a condenser microphone, there are a few benefits to that as well. Condenser microphones are often touted as sounding a lot more natural. They have a lot more audio detail to them and they're a lot more sensitive. They also have more dynamic range to them. That means softer voices sound softer, it can have less dB level, and also louder voices sound louder. They're gonna hit louder volume levels. This also though puts you at more danger of clipping, just so you know. Condenser microphones are also really good for ambient miking. Now what does that mean? That means if you're putting a microphone farther away, let's say a little bit farther from an acoustic guitar, maybe 
one to two feet away or even up to like six feet away, they can pick up that sound a lot more naturally and in a lot more detail than a dynamic microphone could. Now, all these things are all amazing and can add a lot more detail and richness to your recording, but it also comes at a trade-off. Like I've said, they have a lot more sensitivity to the room around them. Condensers by their very nature are going to pick up more stuff around you. Now, let's go back to dynamics for a second because I have a question I wanna ask you. What is your application for the dynamic microphone? Broadcast, voiceover, podcasting? Are you talking about recording instrumentals like a guitar, guitar cab, drums? Are you talking about recording musical vocals like singing? Well, I'm not gonna go into as much detail as I am on the condenser part of this video because I find dynamics are a little bit easier to narrow down to a few specific models. That's because I find there's a lot less variance in tonal quality with dynamic microphones. A decent amount, but not nearly the same amount as with a condenser microphone. So we're gonna go through these three categories and I'm going to explain to you the ones I think you should at least look further into. For broadcast microphones, there's a bunch of microphones that are specifically targeted towards that demographic. There's things like the Rode Podmic, the Rode Procaster, the Shure MV7, the Shure SM7B, that's a big one. I, anyone who's on this channel knows I have opinions on that microphone. And then the Electro Voice RA20, otherwise known as the microphone you're hearing right now. They're gonna range in different price points and they're also gonna boost certain frequencies, but you should also expect kind of a low mid-range radio friendly tone to most of them. When it comes to instrument microphones, here are the microphones I would prefer. Sure, SM57, an absolute legend. The Sennheiser E609 or the 906, those are microphones that are specifically meant for recording guitar cabinets. They can be used for other applications, but they excel at high volume guitar recording. Sennheiser MD421 are legendary on toms. I've also seen them used on vocals before and on guitar cabs. Super flexible, super awesome. The RE20 is amazing for voiceover, as I've already said, but also guitar cabs and bass drum. Also, if you ever are in a situation where you're going to be recording an upright bass, this mic is choice. Vocals, Shure SM58, as I've mentioned before. You could also do a Shure SM57, just slap a pop filter on it. Telefunken M80 is a super cardioid microphone, which means it's gonna reject even more of the room, and Telefunken is an amazing brand. Again, the Sennheiser MD421, amazing for vocals, especially for that sort of vintagey, warm sound. And then the Shure SM7B, really great for a little bit darker sound to your vocal. Now, let's get into condensers, and I will recommend a few models to you, but I'm not going to be as flippant about throwing out models with a condenser because it's a little bit more nuanced. Condensers in general are also going to be a little bit more of an investment financially and through all of the things you're going to need to A, protect them and to treat your room if it's super reflective. First thing to ask is what is your application? Are you going to need to record multiple people with your condenser microphone? Because then you're going to have to worry about something called a polar pattern. Now a polar pattern is essentially the direction in which the microphone picks up the most signal. The most common one and the one you're probably going to be working with the most is cardioid. Now cardioid is pretty easy. When you think of the word cardio, you think of a heart, right? Well, it picks up in a heart-like shape. Now the one in front of me, the RE20, is also a cardioid polar pattern, meaning it's going to pick up everything around my face in like a reverse heart. So it's going to pick up a little bit of the stuff like right behind it. Think of this as like the little butt cheek of the heart. And then it's going to pick up everything around me. Now with condensers, you'll find a few of them come with a few other different polar patterns. Things like figure eight means they're gonna pick up from both sides of the microphone. This is great if you're gonna work in a podcast where you can only have one mic, you can pick up from both sides. There's also Omni, meaning you're gonna pick up from literally every side. And then there's some more specific ones, super cardioid, meaning uh, like razor thin version of cardioid, wide cardioid, a wider cardioid. But for the most part, if you're just gonna be recording yourself, just use cardioid. The reason I didn't mention polar patterns when it comes to dynamic microphones is because 95% of dynamic microphones are, are inherently going to be cardioid microphones and the 5% that aren't are probably going to be super cardioid, a more extreme, thinner version of cardioid. But if you do fall into the category of people that need to buy a microphone 
that has multiple polar patterns, say you need to pick up from both sides of the microphone or all sides of the microphone for your podcast, your choice becomes a little bit more limited, especially if you're working within the budget category. And I'm going to assume if you're watching this video because you're learning about what microphone to buy, you're probably buying a budget microphone. So in that case, I just have two I'd recommend to you. The AKG P420, it's gonna have a little bit more of a high end sound and the Lewitt 441 Flex, which is super flexible. I love that microphone and has plenty of polar patterns to suit whatever need you need to suit whatever need you need now here's the part of the video that we talk about frequency response and this is what most people see is like the holy bible of microphones and to an extent that's true it can tell you a lot about what a microphone is good and good and at work good and <laughs> It can tell you a lot about what a microphone is good and not good at recording. That being said, it's kind of like reading an item on a menu uh, and, and deciding that's exactly what you're going to like without actually tasting it first. It can give you a good idea, but you're going to have to pay attention to all the things around it before you make your final decision. Now, when we look at a frequency response chart, it's going to go from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. 20 hertz is the lowest frequency that a human being can hear. 20,000 hertz is the highest frequency that a human being can hear. So when you look at a frequency response chart, 20 is going to be the farthest left, 20,000 is going to be the farthest right. And on that frequency response chart, you're going to see a squiggly line. This is basically just your line chart that you learn in school. Where you see a higher bump, that is more of a boost. So if you see more higher bumps towards the right side of that graph, that means the microphone is going to have more of a boost in the high end. If you see more of a bump in the low side of the graph, that means your microphone might be better at boosting low end. Now dead center in the middle of that frequency response chart, you're going to see a bold line. It's going to be a darker line than anything else. That's zero dB. If the line is floating around zero dB, that means it's neither boosting nor cutting. Below that line, it's cutting. Above that line, it's boosting. This is a good way to analyze the DNA of your microphone. And from there, you can make a more informed decision. So now that we understand what a frequency response chart is, you have kind of two ways to look at this. Let's take a look at the AKG C214, an amazing microphone that boosts a lot of high end. Now, when we look at it, we're gonna see a pretty big spike in the high end. And we're also gonna see a lot of roll off in the low end which tells us that this microphone is great for boosting high-end frequencies. And there's two ways to look at that. We can say, hey, I have a naturally high voice. This microphone boosts high voices. Well, I can then say to myself, hmm, do I wanna exaggerate my voice more? I like the way my voice sounds and therefore I want that to be more of a feature. Or do I wanna say, hey, I have a low voice, this microphone boosts high end. That way, the high end of my voice, which I don't think is very present, is more present with this microphone. Essentially, what we're saying is, do I want to choose a microphone that boosts my features, or do I want to choose a microphone that's going to enhance the features that I think my voice lacks? Then from there, I can continue on my YouTube escapade after this video. Thank you for watching. And then I can go on check out some reviews, and make a more informed decision in that manner. Now, with that in mind, let me recommend to you a few microphones in the budget range that have more of a high-end frequency to them. We have the AKG P420, which, as stated before, has multiple polar patterns, so it's more flexible. The Lewitt LCT440 and the Lewitt LCT441 Flex. The 441 Flex is the one that has multiple polar patterns, hence why it's called Flex. For flexible. We have the Rode NC1A, the Aston Spirit, and as stated before, the AKG C214. I love the 214. Probably my favorite out of the microphones I just listed, along with the 440 and 441 Flex. Now, the inverse of that, let's talk about microphones that support a lot of low-end frequencies. I find that the Audio-Technica AT2020 and AT2035 are superb for having a lot of low-end support to them. Same as well for the Rode NT1. That's the microphone I own the AT4040, and also, if you want to spend a little bit more, this is not a budget microphone, but the Neumann TLM-103 is amazing. The Rode NC1, one of the most popular microphones for budget use, is based off of the Neumann TLM-103, so amazing mic. Now, one thing you've probably noticed is I haven't mentioned USB microphones, and that's not to say that there aren't USB microphones out there that sound awesome. There are especially a lot of high-end USB microphones as of lately, 
marketing themselves towards streamers and gamers. But here on this channel, we're definitely more devoted towards audio recording, music production, things like that. And I kind of have a personal opinion about USB microphones, along with the fact that I don't know as much about them, they lack a sense of upgradability. Now what that means is whenever you're buying a microphone that is not a USB microphone, you're also going to need to buy something called an audio interface. This is the way that you get the microphone to connect to your computer and convert it into a digital signal that your computer can actually read and process. Now what's great about an audio interface is whenever you've decided that your budget microphone that you've just bought isn't good for your needs anymore, you can buy a new microphone that's more expensive and keep your audio interface. Basically what I'm saying is with a USB microphone, there is no upgradability. At a certain point, if you want to upgrade, you're going to need to buy an audio interface and a brand new microphone. So if you plan to stay in the audio game for a while and you're going to upgrade your system in the future, it's best to spend the money on an audio interface now maybe buy a cheaper microphone and upgrade that into the future. Now, there's also a price barrier I wanna talk about. You're going to notice when you go on Amazon, searching the cheapest microphones you're gonna buy, you're gonna see microphones there for $30, $40 that market themselves as a condenser microphone. And that's true, they are a condenser microphone. But in general, I would try and stick to $80 plus. Now, there's a few microphones in that range I'll recommend to you. That's about the threshold that I would recommend Anything below that, the quality becomes noticeably worse. Now, if you're gonna spend around $80, I think the Samson CO1, anything by Behringer like the B1, they're gonna get you there. You can also buy a used Shure SM57 or a Shure SM58 for around that price range as well. Now, with all that info thrown at your face, <laughs> let me give you a little introduction into the audio community. This is kind of a rant, um, but I think it has good intentions. I love audio and everyone in this community does as well. And with people that are very passionate about things and with a medium that can be so subjective, you're going to see a lot of strong opinions out there. For me, what I want you to take away from the last part of this video is there will be certain groups out there who will tell you definitively that a certain microphone or a certain specific sect of microphones are objectively and always better. This is something that I personally do not agree. And I think that shaming people for the gear that they buy, that's something that really rubs me the wrong way. And I've seen people begin to get gear in this community and understand how to begin working in their audio medium and then quit because there's a little bit of an element of toxicity. Now that's not true for 95 to 97% of people out there. And honestly, I'm sure this is true of any community with strongly impassioned people out there. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a little off topic, but I'm assuming you came to this video because you are beginning your journey into understanding how audio can influence and enhance your medium, whatever you're working with in music, voiceover, podcasting. Just know that there is an element of toxicity out there and you don't have to listen to it because there are so many more amazing people in this community and other communities that are here to just help you without the bias. Disorganized rant at the end of my relatively well-spoken video seems like a fitting way to end. Anyways, if you'd like more info, you can follow me on Instagram at Real Audio Haze. Please don't hesitate to reach out in the YouTube comments. You can uh, DM me on Instagram. I'm always there to answer questions. If you'd like to work on a mixing project or you'd like to take lessons, you can email me at realaudiohaze at gmail.com. And with that, I'll see you in the next video, my friends. Goodbye.